Hello and welcome to another World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. In the classic narrative, the Second World War starts with the invasion of Poland in 1939. Though for the Chinese it started with the Japanese invasion of Manchuria in 1931. I notice Wikipedia solves this start date problem by stating related conflicts started earlier. And that's what we'll be looking at today, the Italian invasion of Ethiopia in 1935 and those foreigners who volunteered to fight for Haile Selassie. But before we get started, a quick word from our sponsors. Oh, I haven't got a sponsor. That's because this podcast is brought to you by the generous donations of listeners like yourself who enjoy the show. Their patronage helps me find the time to put the show together for you. If you want to see how it works, go to patreon.com slash ww2podcast where you'll get a lovely video of me explaining it all. Uh, and you'll notice I'm I'm not on a on a get rich quick scheme. <laughs> right, so that's that's enough of that. Um I'm joined by Christopher Othen. Christopher is the author of Lost Lions of Judah, Haley Selassie's Mongrel Foreign Legion. Now, um my knowledge of the war doesn't go much beyond Evelyn War's parody on it. Uh, Scoop. So let's start by looking at Ethiopia itself. What's it like before the war breaks out in um, in 1935? No, well, actually, 34 is with the time when it all starts kicking off. But in that time, Ethiopia is basically it's a feudal state. It's an empire under Haile Selassie. It is medieval compared to, in many ways, compared to uh, to Western or uh, Eastern Europe. It's well, what's happening really is you've got a lot of Rasses, which is the name given to the warlords uh, come uh, aristocrats around the country. They've got their own private armies, they've got their own private fiefdoms. They're in some cases as powerful as Haile Selassie. Every time an emperor dies, they rush to have a civil war and put another one back on the throne. It's a place where women are second-class citizens, as in most of Africa at the time, where there's no real medical system. There's a lot of witch doctors around. There's not much of a telephone system. There's not much of a road system. There aren't many cars. It's not you know, the back of beyond. It has a sort of... A tradition, a civilization that goes back you know, a long time. It, Ethiopia was mentioned in the Bible for what it's worth. But it is compared to, to Europe, compared to many other places in the world, it is regarded as being very much a backwater. Charming, alarming, but still nowhere close technologically or you know, perhaps in a civilizational sense to, in Western eyes at the time to being up there with, the, with Europe. It's, it's also curiously, I hadn't realized it's the only indi- it, it was the only independent state in Africa. It was the only sort of long-lasting one. There was Liberia on the other side of the continent, which was an artificial state created by the Americans. So you count that, you don't count that. People are a bit uh, a bit iffy about it. It was the only one which is kind of has a history going back into African time, in African sort of history before the Arabs, before the white people came. So yeah, for that it has a lot of significance. African Americans, for example, are really in love with Ethiopia. It turns up in a lot of jazz songs. It turns up as a kind of in in hymns. There was. Um, as of an early kind of uh, sort of pro to African American movement, not the NACP, but similar ones, whose hymn was, you know, Ethiopia be joyous. It's actually about African Americans, but Ethiopia was this big symbolic place for them, somewhere where you know black men could be free or black women could be free. And also, it had a similar kind of uh, symbolism to a lot of uh, the kind of African subjects in the colonial places. They all dreamed about you know escaping from know, wherever Kenya or you know the Congo and going to Ethiopia to be to live as free men. I mean, of course, Ethiopia is actually, you know, a fairly dicey place, but they still <laughs> saw it as being a, you know, heaven on earth for them. So, Haley Selassie, though, he, he is, he has, I was going to say, he's not backward looking. He is a moderniser, isn't he? Is that the right way to put it? Yeah, definitely. He's definitely a moderniser. He got a lot of trouble, really, because there's a, a lot of tra- the Ethiopians, the influential, like the Rasses and the aristocrats, are very, very traditionalist. They don't believe in change at all. They're also extremely xenophobic. They hate foreigners. Doesn't matter, they're Europeans, Africans, they just hate everyone who's not Ethiopian. So Heidi Selassie is trying to sort of gently push Ethiopia into the 20th century, mainly because he knows it's important for the country, but also if he wants to keep the colonialist hands on Ethiopia, you've got to have the ability to defend yourself, you know. And so he's trying to do this. The Rasses, in many ways, are trying to stop him from doing that. They're being, they're putting up roadblocks. They're telling him not to do stuff. They're rejecting his uh, his reforms. But he definitely is a modernising person. Was seen by the world as being a modernising uh, emperor. He was very popular. You know, people in the West really liked him. Before the war breaks out, he does actually start to bring in foreigners for various uh, reasons. I mean, <laughs> and just to pull one out of the hat. You know, there's, there's uh, Her- Herbert Julian he brings over, which for the most 
peculiar of reasons. Yeah, he wanted to, Hubert Julian was a Trinidadian pilot, came from a very wealthy black family in Trinidad. Uh, he ended up in New York where he called himself the Black Eagle and he was basically a novelty parachutist. He used to jump out of planes over New York advertising, you know, various things, wearing sort of red tights and playing the saxophone. He got sponsored for this, but also he got some more money from the undertakers who said that they, they'd got the, the right to display his body if the parachute didn't open. <laughs> he was a really interesting bloke, but I mean, he didn't have much luck. He, he said he got through a lot in the face of a pretty fierce and racial prejudice at the time, but he, he was his larger-than-life figure. He was like 6'4", I mean, literally larger-than-life. He was very tall people in those days. Big, booming, very posh-sounding voice, kind of British voice. And he just liked to – sometimes his stories, they say they exaggerate a little. But also, bad luck. One time he was coming down the parachute. He gets blown off course, goes into the window of a building, wakes up, looks up. There's about 50 white guys putting guns at him. He's gone into a police station which is like the worst place you can possibly land as a black, black guy in New York in the 1920s. <laughs> but anyway, he, was, he so became quite one as a parachutist. And when Haile Selassie got uh, had his coronation in 1930, Haile Selassie's cousin, I think, was studying medicine over in New York, and he knew about Julian. And he basically hired Julian to go and be a parachutist at the coronation, to sort of display like pan-African, pan-black sort of brotherhood. That was the aim they were going for. Although in the end, I mean, Julian was very popular very briefly. Uh, and then he... St- well, stole's too strong a word. He borrowed the Emperor's plane because at the, the time they only had three aeroplanes in the, in the Ethiopian Air Force. So he stole a third of it just to show off and then managed to crash it into a tree, at which point they arrested him and deported him from the country. I mean, it could have happened to anybody, I'm sure, but it happened to Hubert Julian. That's not like that happened to Hubert Julian. No. Fascinating guy, but you wouldn't trust him with your wallet. I thought it was a good, interesting reflection on um, for a moderniser, you bring in a parachutist, which doesn't seem much you now when you look back at a parachutist at a coronation. It doesn't seem very spectacular, but I imagine for a country that hasn't necessarily seen a lot of parachutists, it would be a thing of wonder and awe. Well, it's like the first parachute jump in Ethiopian history. In fact, probably one of the, one of the very first plane rides, I think, because they only have got a, an Air Force in about 28 or 29 with some French mercenaries set one up. But it's also pretty uh, extraordinary in the West. Remember, there were barnstormers in the 1920s who go around America with, like, you know, they go in a couple of planes and a parachute. They do the same kind of tricks. They, you know, fly the planes upside down, they do some wing walking. Then they jump out, and people are like, wow, he's climbing down in a parachute. Will he die? Will he not die? So it was, it was new to everybody, not just the Ethiopians. Mm. It, 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 it's perhaps unfair to pull him out to, st- to start with, uh, because there were, there were, there's, there's official missions, I guess, over there that, are, that have been sent over as, as modernizers from other countries, though, aren't they? Yeah, military missions. But I mean, Haile Selassie had like, advisors from different countries. Had, like an American guy was advising him on, I think, on economics, like, some British and Swiss people advising him on uh, slavery. They said slavery in Ethiopia, and they're trying to get rid of it. But the ones we, I suppose we're thinking about here is the military um, missions. And the Ethiopians were they knew they needed basically foreigners who knew how to fight to train up there because they didn't really have an army. They had like a honey said he had a small kind of force himself, and then each ras had their own kind of like uh, territorial kind of militia types. And so Ali Selassie was smart enough not to bring in any of the big colonial powers like Britain or France because they thought they might have you know, ambitions on getting their hands on Ethiopia. So he went for countries like Sweden. There was a small Swedish uh, military mission, I think five guys, and just one called Viking Tam. And also a couple of Belgians, a Belgian mission. Obviously, Belgium had the possessions for the Congo and the like, but they weren't really that close to Ethiopia, so they thought he could risk it. He also, at one point in 34, was trying to get some Nazi Germans to come over, the retired army officers there. But there was, uh, Hitler didn't want to antagonize Mussolini too much at that time. So that was kind of, that was squashed. So yeah, you had like the, the Swedish mission, you had the um, Belgian mission, and later on you'll have like a mission from uh, some Ottoman Turks and various other individuals who turn up. So I, I thought it was really bizarre that the, you know, Sweden's a new, neutral country. You wouldn't have thought they'd be sending foreign advisors. Um, and the Belgians, you know, it's, they don't exactly have a great reputation in Africa with the Congo. <laughs> 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 no, you, you wouldn't think that they were the last people you'd want to get. Well, some of the Nazi Germans, for God's well, sake. But I mean, the thing is that the, the Belgians had uh, an army force in the Congo called the Force Publique, which was basically black soldiers, white officers. And it was bizarrely quite well respected. It, it was regarded as being a pretty fierce fighting force. It fought during the, uh, the First World War against some of the Germans down there. And the Ethiopians had a high opinion of it. That's why they wanted the Belgians. The Swedes. There were, the reason they turned up, as far as I know, is that there were some Swedish businessmen, a small community of Swedes in Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia. And they were seeing all these Belgians marching around. They weren't too happy about it. I don't know why, but they didn't like Belgians. And so they asked, you know, they, they sent letters back home, you know, can we – they actually tried to recruit independently, like a kind of mercenary kind of uh, advice to come over. 
Swedish government didn't like this. They, they thought about it and figured, well, you know, we're neutral-ish, but Ethiopia is a nice place, good weather, and there's a chance of perhaps expanding Swedish power a little bit. So they put together a small military mission, sent them across to, uh, to train up officers of the uh, of Haile Selassie's forces. Did the military missions, did they, were the people assigned to them or did they volunteer? It's a bit of a backwater to get sent to, isn't it? Oh, yeah. But, uh, the ones for Sweden, they actually advertised in the newspaper. I think they put like an advert in the newspaper, are oh, you a soldier? Do you want to go to Ethiopia? You know, write to this PO box. The Belgian ones, I think they were asked to volunteer. I mean, it was probably regarded as being a fairly exotic location. Because, you know, remember, as it's the, last, or the, the only sort of independent, apart from Liberia, nation in Africa, it has a certain kind of a glamour around it. Haile Selassie had a, was a glamorous figure. You know, the black emperor with this kind of this kind of proud, barely known nation. So I don't think they had any trouble getting hold of people to go over there, especially not if the uh, the Belgians had knowledge of the Congo. It was a nicer place than the Congo, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. You know, the Congo was not quite uh, as pleasant as Ethiopia could be. So if, if we turn to the war, why on earth did um, Italy feel the need to, you know, invade Ethiopia? Why did it, what was its hold on, you know, why did it want it? Well, it, Italy had a couple of colonial possessions, there, Italian Somaliland and the like, uh, Eritrea, I think. And they, they didn't really, the invasion came about because of a clash in late 1934 at this place called Wow Wow, down in the south of Ethiopia. It's basically a little bit of nothing in the middle of nowhere. It's an oasis and that's about it. The Ethiopians thought it was in Ethiopia, which is correct, really. The Italians seemed to be under the impression it was in Italian Somaliland. Now, nothing really happened. You had like, Italian troops, uh, Ethiopian troops, and also the Somali troops who worked for the Italians would share the oasis, no problem. But I think it's December 34. There's some Ethiopian troops with some Brits there, Brit British surveyors who are there to try and sort out where the border really is. And there's some kind of a confrontation between the Ethiopians and the Somalis with the Italian officers. You know, I think someone deserted from the Somali side. The Ethiopians hit him, sent him off, and uh, a fight broke out. There was some firefights and people got killed and the whole thing just escalated dramatically it wasn't pre-planned but once it happened Mussolini didn't want to back down I think he saw this as an opportunity to expand Italian uh, imperial presence he was still sort of locked into that kind of idea that you would show you were a grand nation by having uh, colonies in you know non-white countries in, in in Africa or maybe in the east somewhere and the thing, it ramped up really slowly. This happened in December, and the war broke out, and it was like in um, autumn of 35. So you know, like nine months of this thing moving slow as a glacier. But it, once it started, it couldn't be stopped. The League of Nations, got, well, they couldn't stop it. The British and the French were to hold back Mussolini, who was an ally at the time. They couldn't stop it. And they just inevitably happened. We've got to remember that back in 1896, it was, there was uh, the Italians then, uh, it wasn't under Mussolini, but their sort of uh, government and their king, had tried to invade uh, Ethiopia before, and they'd been defeated. It was like the biggest defeat by white forces in Africa in pretty much the European history. I think 7,000 Italian soldiers were just massacred. And it was, it was just a big point of pride for the Ethiopians and a big, a terrible, shaming moment for the Italians. And so the chance of getting revenge on Ethiopia, I think, was too big a thing to let up. It's a bit like, I don't know, maybe look like Iraq or something like that with the Bushes and the, the American foreign policy. Then maybe there's an element of that. It's a wanting to get revenge for things that went wrong earlier on. I also wondered if there was a thing where the Ethiopians thought, well, we've beaten them before. <laughs> Why do we need to back down? We beat, we'll beat them again. They were completely convinced they would win. I mean, even for the first few months when things like Gambari, they just assumed they were going to win. They beat them before. I mean, you, you went up to in the north where the battles were and there were still like Italian bones there amongst like the rocks and things. It was, you know, it was a done deal. So no one for a second thought the Italians would win. Of course... Outside Ethiopia, everyone thought the Italians would win, but that's a whole other story. Well, yeah, you've got that whole we won because the, we won because we had the machine gun and they did not. Yes, I mean <laughs> they won because the Italians won because they had airplanes and poison gas. That was it. I mean, you know, the Ethiopians didn't have nothing. They had they had rifles, they had some machine guns which they bought from Nazi Germany. Get another story, but they didn't have much of an air force and they didn't have much heavy weapons. So maybe that's one of the reasons. You touched upon the world reaction. I mean, did did. <laughs> I was, did, did anybody try to stop it? I mean, the League of Nations is set up exactly for this kind of incident. Well, the League of Nations is a paper tiger. It doesn't have any troops. It's been like the United Nations, but it didn't have the troops. So There's nothing it could really do. You know, it could just... Other nations could agree to, uh, you know, not to supply things. They could agree to trade embargoes, but Italy didn't really care very much. And a lot... Remember, Italy was quite important in terms of foreign policy, because you got the rise of Nazi Germany, obviously, in 1933. At the time, Hitler and Mussolini were not allies. 
you know, Mossadegh actually didn't like or didn't trust Hitler very much. Because in 34 you had the uh, the attempted coup by Nazi Austrians to overthrow the government there, Adolfus's dictatorship, and make um, Austria part of the of the, German, of the Third Reich. And it failed. Mainly it failed because Mussolini sent tanks to the border and threatened Hitler. But so it did mean that you know Mussolini was an enemy of Hitler. And people like France and Britain in the West and the Soviet Union in the East, they wanted to keep it that way. So they wanted Italy on side to be their ally, so as a bulwark against the Germans. So they don't want to alienate them too much by taking military action if he starts invading Ethiopia. That's not going to happen. So they try and put pressure on him, but at the same time, there's not really a lot, in their view at least, that they can do. But while governments are not keen to do much, um, this is a surprising reaction across the world with people volunteering to fight for Ethiopia. Oh, yeah. There was, I mean, like thousands and thousands of men came forward in different places. I mean, I mean, many thousands of African-Americans have volunteered. There were people in South Africa. There were lots of Japanese uh, guys who wanted to come over and fight. It didn't work out because Ethiopia didn't need them and didn't want them. I mean, on a political sense, um, they didn't want foreigners coming to Ethiopia because that could confuse things. Haile Selassie still thought the League of Nations would be able to stop the Italians, which, you know, we know is a joke, but he thought that for quite a long time. So he turned down offers of legions from you know various different countries, but at the same time, I mean, you know, the Italians had their own foreign troops. You know, they were recruiting um, Italian Americans, uh, Italians living in Argentina, Italians living in Brazil, and places like that. So they were saying, you know, that the Holy Slassy shouldn't use foreign troops. They had their own foreign troops, and also the League of Nations tried to put down some uh, some rules saying that foreigners shouldn't go and fight in uh, in Ethiopia. What's the motivation behind, or I can perhaps say, so, you know, you mentioned the motivation for the African Americans. You know, what's the motivation for some of the, you know, the the, the, the uh, you know, white white guys from well wherever. You know, what, I, <laughs> what's their affinity to go and fight for Haile Selassie? I think uh, I suppose some. Well, actually, it wasn't really a left wing cause. It wasn't there were too many anti fascists there because the Soviet Union was supporting uh, Italy at the time. You know, it kind of broke uh, various trade embargoes and kept supplying Italy during the war. It was more a sense of adventure, I think. That you know, a, you know, a black nation with a black emperor had a kind of glamour to it. It may be a bit of a patronising kind of boy's own glamour, but that's what they saw. They also people thought the Ethiopians would want foreign troops, so that seemed like the obvious place to go. And also, the, the Italians weren't recruiting anyone; it wasn't only like an Italian, uh, Italian American or Italian Argentinian. So, if you wanted to go fight in uh, in the war, which a lot of people did for whatever reason, you would probably think Ethiopia was the obvious place to go. The vast, vast majority are turned away. I mean, they really don't get many slip through, do they? No, I mean, for a start, Ethiopia's a long way away. You know, you've got to have money and a passport, and it's expensive to get down there. If you look at, say, the Spanish Civil War, which kind of follows on from this, a lot of people went to fight there because their passage was paid for them. Here it's not. You might be, you know, if you're in, you're in New York, you want to go to Ethiopia, you've got to have a lot of money, and it's not going to happen. And the fact that the Ethiopians weren't exactly welcoming you when you got there, that made it even more difficult. So, you know, that they, they weren't, it wasn't going to happen, and the few who made it there... While some kind of slip through and end up joining the, the Ethiopian army, a lot of them were actually re- deported when the fighting started by the Ethiopians. They just, they said they were xenophobic. They didn't like foreigners, and it was just another reason to get rid of people. <laughs> and it is a real disparate group of uh, people who get through. You've got polit- professional revolutionaries. You seem to have people with just too much money. It's incredible. They're a bizarre group. I mean, what's I think notable about them is a lot of them come from fairly kind of, I'm not going to say minor countries, but countries which are not big players in the world scene. You know, Czechoslovakia, Cuba, Trinidad, uh, you know, places like this. I think it's one of the reasons they might be allowed to stay because they weren't going to jeopardize the League of Nations negotiations. You know, they're not like from Britain or from France. They're from, you know, from Cuba, for goodness sake. And so no one really notices stuff like that. That's one of the reasons that they, they got through. They were just weird people. There were only about 40, 40 people who I think played a kind of military role that I found out about who were mostly white, mostly right-wing, sometimes very right-wing, and seemed to be more interested in adventure and trying to shoot some people than anything else. So there was much money around. I couldn't get why the right-wingers, so you've got the Irish were trying to get there, the Irish fascists, and then there's 10... Be- and, and again, as I said before we started, you know, I, I do like, uh, I, I was going to say Scoop, but I'm actually thinking of um, P.G. Woodhouse. I just kept thinking of um, Spode, the amateur dictator in P.G. Woodhouse when I'm thinking about... With the black shorts. <laughs> uh, yeah, with the Irish fascist who's trying to get there and he doesn't get there. Well, the Irish, the Irish fascists are trying to fight for the Italians. That was General O'Duffy. 
And he would later go on to fight for, uh, actually, for Franco in the Spanish Civil War. So he got his wish eventually, and it turned out to be a disaster for him. But yeah, the, the Belgians, yeah, I mean, this is just weird. I mean, the, the, Bel- the, the Ethiopians actually recruited, um, I think they're about uh, 11 Belgian soldiers, because basically the Belgian official military mission was told to pull out if there was a war. And Ethiopians valued Belgian uh, support and valued Belgian trainers. So they would only replace it with their own, you know, private militia. The people they recruited, they recruited a guy called uh, Leopold Royals, like a retired lieutenant colonel. He was a First World War hero, got shot in the throat by some Germans, and he couldn't speak louder than a whisper. So kind of an odd guy to be training soldiers, you know. And he was also a member of something called the Legion Nationale, which was a fascist group. They weren't very keen on Germany, but they were very keen on Mussolini. They were an out-and-out Belgian fascist group. Had the, you know, the torch-lit parades, the black shirts and the marches and stuff. And so he, they recruited him, and then he recruited these other, I think, what was it, 10 other people, 11 other people. And then they went down to uh, to Ethiopia. Now, I mean, I guess the Ethiopians didn't know he was a fascist, which shows distinct lack of a you know background checking on their part. Journalists certainly knew there were there were reports in the newspapers in, in both France and uh, in America pointing out that you know they're not in a big way they were still quite sympathetic. But they did point out that Royal you know came from this background where he had personally made comments saying how much he liked Mussolini in the past, and here he is as a mercenary you know fighting for Ethiopia against the Italian fascists. Why they did it, I think the money, to be honest. The money was very important. They, they were getting paid very good money. I think Royal was getting paid something like every month. He was getting paid more like three times the amount of the highest kind of uh, paid member of the, Brit- the Belgian military. So it's a fair chunk of money. And he was retired, you know. He had a bit of money, but, you know, extra money is always useful. That's a reason. Some of them did go on to become converts to the Ethiopian cause. Some of them hated the Ethiopians and got out as quickly as possible. There was a rumor that one of the uh, Belgians in the official mission, a guy called Camber, I think it was at Cambia, had he died um, for natural causes in the early days of the war before he could be pulled out. Everyone believed he'd been poisoned by the Ethiopians because they didn't like whites. So it's a very strange situation with sending a Belgian fascist in with this. Why? Haile Selassie thought it was a good idea. I don't know. He was a dictator. You know, Haile Selassie was a dictator, albeit you know an absolute monarch. I don't think that really explains why he'd want Belgian fascists around. I think they just didn't check. Because the Ethiopians were, as I said, very xenophobic. So I think the foreigners are called Ferengi. You know, so I think they just figured it didn't matter. What, they didn't care what the Ferengi believed. They were there to do a job, to train people, then they went home again. And so their politics would not even be worth considering. It also attracted quite a few flyers. And I wondered if the, if the pilots sort of went over as a chance to fly. Because I imagine chances to fly must be, at this time, limited. You know, it's a new technology, and they thought perhaps if they went over, they'd be get a bit of adventure and a chance to fly. Possible, yeah. I mean, although, to be fair, I think in America, certainly, there were far more chances. There were a lot of um, ch- planes available cheap after the war, because the Americans sold off a lot of their stock, including like, the Thompson machine guns and also biplanes. So maybe it wasn't quite like that. But yeah, you're right, maybe that, that might have been a reason. But mostly, I mean, the ones who did come over, they you know, they were experienced pilots. Often they had served in the... Um, in the national air forces, you know. So I think they were asking after the money. They were looking for a payday. They, everyone assumed air power would be vitally important, which it was, though not the way they thought it. And they figured that Haile Selassie you know, was emperor in this kind of this nation. They must have lots of gold coins around, and they'd readily hire them. So they didn't really turn out that way. I guess as well to be a pilot this time, you, in, in theory, you. I'm, I'm, I was going down a train of thought. That I've just realised I can blow myself out of the water. But in theory, you have to have money to do it. So you've got. Hugo de Wet and uh, Hilaire de Berrier. Hilaire de Berrier's real name is uh, sort of Hal Be- Harold Berrier. He's an American from North Dakota who's pretending to be a French aristocrat. <laughs> he's he's a, an interesting guy. He ended up like in the John Birch Society after the war, like a real kind of anti-communist, sort of like right-wing, uh, right-wing American thing. He was actually in Dallas the day John F. Kennedy was shot, and he occasionally gets dragged into those kind of assassination conspiracies. I don't think anything to do with it, but that's that's part of it. But yeah, he was he was like a sort of middle class of you know someone from North Dakota who had reinvented himself in Paris as a French aristocrat. He was, he was actually a count, you know, Count Hilaire de Berrier. And he was, yeah, he was over there, I think, because he belonged, he was very right wing, probably extremely racist, but at the same time, he was a member of Action Francaise, the sort of notorious French uh, monarchist organization, very anti Semitic, very right wing. And I think, well, Action Francaise supported the Italians. He, I think, put his money on an emperor. He figured an emperor was better than an Italian dictator. So that's why he went to Addis Ababa. Hugh DeWitt was just an alcoholic. I think whose parents were trying to get rid of him, so they sent him to Ethiopia. But on the on the flip side of that, you get like John Robinson, black American guy, who I find reference him referenced as the father of the 
Tuskegee, Tuskegee, Tuskegee. Tuskegee Airmen. Yeah, I'm not sure he, he played a big role there. There was connections. There were certainly connections with that kind of the Black Air Force. He, yeah, he was a very important figure, actually. He was a, a self, well, he was a pilot from Chicago. Came from not a particularly wealthy background anyway, not like Hooper Julian. And basically, he wanted to fly from an early age, and he and a couple of others, sort of, one of the black pilots, managed to get their way onto a flying course. He was actually working as a janitor at the school because they wouldn't, they wouldn't teach uh, sort of African Americans at the time. And I think they, they the combination of sort of uh, bullying and I think I'll say threatened legal action, they managed to get taught. And then they brought along kind of other black pilots or black would-be pilots, and they taught, they trained them themselves. So in Chicago, they had, I think they were called the Challenger um, Air Company or something like this. And they put on some flying displays in the black districts and became quite well known. And as I said, Ethiopia was a big uh, big thing for, for African Americans. And so, so in this is in 35, before the war starts, when they kind of run up to the war, they decide they want to send across one of, the, one of their, um, their pilots. And John Robinson's the man who gets chosen. And he eventually is sent over there. Like a lot of Americans, even so African Americans, he thought Ethiopia was quite a backward nation. It was, you know, their, their guiding star of freedom, but still quite backward. And he really thought he'd turn up there and be like this kind of amazing, kind of modern pilot. He was a bit disappointed to be told that the Air Force already had lots of, you know, sort of Ethiopian pilots who had more experience than he did. He thought he was going to be like the head of the Air Force, and really it was run by a Frenchman who was not interested in him. And there was a lot of other pilots who weren't interested in him. They made him a trainer in the end. And, you know, he was. An important guy, but like all, merc- all mercenaries throughout human history, he exaggerated his experiences. He'd write home to his friends back in Chicago saying he was head of the Air Force, and he wasn't. You know, he was just an instructor. And I guess it'd be, no, it'd be quite difficult at that time to, uh, to contradict him. Yeah, yeah, you can't like, turn on the television and see what's going on. You know, you have to trust <laughs> his letters, which arrive like every three months or something. You know, I mean, he achieved a lot. He was an important guy, and he certainly did. He certainly flew around in the war zone. You know, the, the none of the Ethiopian planes had had weapons; they weren't armed, so they were basically just bringing letters and communications and sometimes evacuating people by air. But he was certainly a brave guy, but he did not, he did not do the half the things he claimed he did. But again, you know, all mercenaries say that. It's not just him. Yeah. What, what happened to the uh, – well, you know, when war breaks out, what happens to the missions? Do they get uh, pulled out, the military missions? They were recalled. The Belgian mission was recalled, although not before having a ridiculous confrontation with a fascist mission at uh, Addis Ababa train station because they wouldn't salute each other. Even though Leopold Roy was like a colonel, but he was retired and he shouldn't have been there. There's only a fist fight. The whole thing was just a joke. But they went home. But the Swedes were supposed to come home, but they refused. They had got really into the Ethiopian cause, and they were determined to stay on. But they'd also got permission, I think, from secretly within their army that it was okay for them to leave the Swedish army for the duration of the war and then join when they got back home again. So they sort of stayed on. I think there was five of them. One went home straight away. And another one left during the course of the war. So by the end, there were three of them. They were kind of trained. They were trying to train up the the officers they had into a kind of form a new kind of like a new division, perhaps. But they hadn't done it by the end of the war, which is about nine months. So I don't think they were very, they were very fast at what they did. But you know, they were they were appreciated for being there. You know, when push comes to shove, how useful were the foreigners? Uh, to the Ethiopian war effort? Yeah, good question. Probably not that useful, <laughs> to be honest. The the people who were training the, the soldiers before the war did something useful. They didn't train too many of them, and maybe not so well, but they were you know, they gave some measure of uh, some modern military tactics. Although other observers say that the moment you know, the Ethiopians kind of marched out of town, they just forgot everything they'd learned and went back to the sort of traditional kind of kind of attack, frontal attack with sort of sword, spears, and rifles because that was you know what they knew. The pilots were kind of useful, but again, there was no combat pilots, so it was just really flying around, uh, you know, picking up wounded. The rest of them were advisors, you know, there was sort of, and they tend to be fairly random people. You got uh, Yelanda Del Valle, who was a rich, rich millionaire Cuban, or his family was millionaires anyway, who was, who went over there to fight. You had uh, two Czechoslovakians, which was uh, Brea and Adolf Palasak. Uh, you had a, a white Russian called Konovalov, who was uh, who was actually living in Ethiopia before the war. There were three um, members of the Ottoman Empire, not even really Turks, because they had lost their Turkish citizenship, who were down in the south. To be honest with you, I, they're, they're more kind of romantic and exciting and glamorous figures than they were actually particularly useful. They all usually exaggerated their um, their adventures to say that they were, you know the heart of the Ethiopian war effort, that they were the ones doing on the planet. They weren't. The Ethiopian commanders, the Rasses, were, again, pretty xenophobic. They weren't going to listen to foreigners. So the foreigners just basically stood around and watched what happened. The interesting people, exciting times, they didn't really affect the course of the war. Yeah, I got the idea that perhaps the, the best, for those that were functioning, the best thing was perhaps as a publicity uh, at best. Yeah, that was it. I mean, they didn't want to talk about it too much. They didn't want to show there were too many foreigners, but it did at least... Sh- 
demonstrate that there were whites on their side. And to some, sometimes that worked in their advantage. Other times, there are there, there plenty of occasions in which Ethiopians tried to kill them because they were, thought they were Italians. You know, so that didn't work out too well. It was so. It was. It was kind of bad. It was good and bad publicity. You know? uh, yeah, I didn't want to kill him because that, it, it's it's the, one of the checks, isn't it? Who, who has a run in with someone thinking he's Italian? He has to ex- talk himself out. Well, what happens is that he's up in the northern front. Things are getting pretty dicey, and he's trying to get away. And he kind of he, him and some followers they kind of run into a village, and the locals think they're Italians, so they probably surrender to him. And he's just like, no, no, I'm fighting with the side, and they kind of pick up their guns again. Uh, you know, Del Val, I think, was supposed to nearly got shot. Roy- Royal, the fascist Belgian, got into some kind of confrontation uh, up in the north, and then he was nearly physically attacked by some Ethiopians. Again, they thought he was a Belgian or something. Like- they thought he was a- an Italian or something like that. So, yeah, it's it's not the best thing for him, to be honest. I, I got the feeling as well that s- some of these men believed in their abilities you know, a bit too much. You've mentioned the Turks in the south, and it's uh, Mehmet. Vehip Pasha. Vehip Pasha, I think his yeah. name is. Yeah, I, I liked it when he he, he he digs his trench system and and describes it as the African Verdun. Yeah, yes, I mean he, the thing is he was actually a very talented soldier. You know, he was a a long term sort of Ottoman soldier. He fought in Gallipoli, for example, when he resigned his commission because he wouldn't serve under a German. But you know, when he went to Ethiopia, I mean, he didn't have a lot to work with. Maybe he was also maybe past his best. He, they create this big trench kind of warp, this trench. Uh, system down in the south to hold off the Italians but you know people looked said saw they didn't have any fire steps they didn't have any water it was just a big kind of it's just a big trench it looked it looked impressive but it nothing more than that I think Pasha must have known that and in the end when the Italians came up the Italians just drove around it so everyone went run and ran away you know he, he wasn't incompetent but I think he felt that there wasn't much more he could do in the in the situation he wasn't government sanctioned was he no, the Turks actually uh, hated him. They took took away his, uh, his Turkish citizenship. It was he had some kind of a run in with Ataturk. That was the reason. All, all the ones who ended up fighting with him had had problems with Ataturk in, in the new Turkey after the fall of the Ottoman Empire. I think it was to do with politics. Maybe it was to do with the massacre of the Armenians and that Vehip Pasha said a bit too much about stuff he shouldn't have talked about. No one's really sure. But the Turkish, like Turks, are described as being like some drug smuggling mercenaries on no part of Turkey, <laughs> which might have been true. I don't know. And something else I found quite peculiar was the, you know, considering the uh, the, the tripartite pact in 1940 with Germany, Japan, and Italy, Germany seems to back Ethiopia, and Ethiopia hopes for support from Japan. Yes, yeah. I mean, probably the weirdest one is the the alliance. Well, not really alliance. The the diplomatic relations between Nazi Germany and Ethiopia. I mean, as as early as I think late 1934, Haile Selassie asked the German, the sort of maybe ambassador or consul in Addis Ababa, if he, if he could buy poison gas from the Third Reich, which is something that Haile Selassie's partisans tend to kind of gloss over because they don't want to talk about that side of things. And the Germans supported; they they actually sold weapons to Haile Selassie, like quite a few machine guns, some anti-tank guns, etc. And there was even talk uh, of uh, the Luftwaffe coming down to take over the Ethiopian Air Force and setting up a kind of like a kind of black Luftwaffe unit down there. Mainly because I think at the time the Luftwaffe was illegal, so I think Göring saw it as a place where he could train up his his, uh, his pilots. It got legalised in thirty five, so the whole thing never happened. But there were all these kind of weird kind of you know connections. There's actually a swastika flag flying over the German consulate in the middle of Addis Ababa. The real reason is not that Hitler was genuinely a Rastafarian or something ridiculous like that, which is a frightening thought. It's just that. At the time, the Germans had their eyes on Austria, which we know they've tried once before. They had their eyes on the military reoccupation of the Rhineland, which is, you know, again, technically German territory, but you could have soldiers there. And they thought that if Italy went off to get involved in the kind of quagmire of a war in Ethiopia, it would distract the, the world's attention for the Germans to do what they wanted up in, in Europe. That was the, the logic behind it. And that's what went on to the start of the war. When someone pointed out to Hitler that it's quite possible Mussolini might actually lose, and if he did that, there was you know Italy would the fascism would crumble in Italy, and there might even be a communist revolution there. At which point the Germans basically changed sides, and over a period of time, but they slowly began to like drop support behind Selassie. They wouldn't sell him more weapons, for example, and started increasing support uh, Mussolini. The Japanese thing. That's even weirder. The Japanese and the Ethiopians, they liked each other a lot. The Ethiopian constitution was based on the Japanese constitution because they saw it as being a kind of um, a modern, first world, technologically advanced nation which still had an emperor, still had tradition. And they really, that's what they wanted in Ethiopia, you know. And there were elements within Japan, I mean, very right wing elements like the, the Black Dragon Society and a faction within the military called the Kodaha who saw Japan's role in the world as being that as the leader of what they call the non-white world. 
So not just the kind of the Asia, but also places like Ethiopia and Africa. And, and there was, for example, quite a lot of contact with the African Americans, who really thought, you know, sort of the Emperor Hirohito was like a, a champion of their cause. So these right wing kind of causes, these right wing kind of groups, they made contact with Ethiopia, and there was like an Ethiopian diplomatic mission went to Tokyo to meet the emperor and stuff like this. It never really went anywhere. There was some trade, but the Ethiopians didn't have anything that the Japanese really wanted. There were a few Japanese businessmen in uh, in Addis Ababa for a while, but they couldn't get paid, so they all went home. I think there was one Japanese woman who was a masseur with a sideline in prostitution, and she was quite popular. That's really about the, the major success the Japanese had. And so when the war starts, the kind of the, the faction in the Japanese military, which is more similar towards Italy, decides it's not going to support Haile Selassie. They're going to support the Italians instead because they're heading towards, you say, the tripartite alliance later on. And in early 36, I think it was in February, there's a coup attempt by the Kodaha, who are the kind of pro-Ethiopian faction, to do with, you know, not to do with Ethiopia, to do with other, other things, that goes dramatically wrong, ends up all being killed or killing themselves. As a result of which, the, you know, the last sort of vestiges of any kind of support for Ethiopia are wiped away, and there's no real chance that they're going to support them. But, you know, I think they gave some, like, some swords and some bandages, and the Ethiopians were regarded as being heroes in, in Japan, but nothing physical very happened. Although, again, there were thousands of Japanese who wanted to go and fight for them. One guy even sent a letter to all the way to Addis Ababa written in his own blood, asking if he could come and serve. But time, distance and money got in the way. Such a peculiar war. So how how did it go for the Ethiopians? Uh, not well, I think it's a short version. But they did okay at the start. The, the Italians coming from the north, everyone expected a southern attack, they're coming from the north. And they were powering down and then one of the uh, Ethiopian armies managed to push back part of the Italian front line, almost to the uh, back to the frontier. This is like in late 35, and this really rattled the Italians because they could not deal with another defeat. They, you know, that wasn't going to happen. And so at this point, they threw more soldiers into it. They started uh, sending uh, using poison gas, using mustard gas, which is you know a crime against humanity at the time, certainly a war crime, and also bombing Red Cross stations. So we had a lot of foreigners. They were working in various Red Cross units, an Ethiopian Red Cross union, also places like Britain and Sweden and things like that, Norway, I think. And they started deliberately targeting the Red Cross. And that sort of combined the fact that there was a lot of uh, – they had air superiority, but they started to push back the, uh, Itali- the Ethiopian troops in the north. And by, like, the spring of '36, it was pretty much all over. Haile Selassie so led a kind of – personally led a kind of last-ditch attack on the Italians – but that didn't really help. And after that, it was it kind of started crumbling. They all flew back to Addis Ababa. There was a lot of looting. Someone tried to burn the town down. And then everyone ran for the the, uh, the, the last train out of uh, out the capital as the Italians came kind of rolling through the, the streets in their tanks. It was a pretty short war. The foreigners didn't exactly stay to fight to the bitter end, did they? No. Well, they, you know, they were mercenaries, <laughs> so they weren't going to risk their lives. But, I mean, a couple did. I mean, Del Val, of all people, the, the Cubans of, you know, son of these kind of millionaire parents, uh, he actually sort of stayed around. He went. To, there was going to last ditch kind of attempt to defend uh, the, the the country from uh, some small. I think called Gora, something like that, or Gora, which is this kind of small town in the in the I think it was in the southwest. And he turned up there. It was only one of the Belgians as well, but everyone else. I think they figured they'd done their duty and they just vanished. I mean, that's what mercenaries do. They're not fight to the death. Most Ethiopians didn't want to fight to the death. To be fair, so it's hardly surprising the mercenaries didn't. I might be wrong, but isn't there some international law against acting as mercenaries? I mean, do they get? I- There's no international law, but there are individual national laws. I think the Americans passed a law saying you couldn't go and serve in front of um, – still in, possibly still in action, I think. You can't go and serve in another nation's army. And Britain had some kind of laws like that, but it, they were spotily uh, enforced. And it really depended if you were fighting with someone they supported or didn't support. But it did mean that – you know, if, if you – because remember, most, back then, most people didn't have a passport because people didn't really travel abroad that much, you know, not privately. So if you applied for a passport, you had to say where you were going to go, and you said, I'm going to Ethiopia – well, you weren't going to get it. So there were never enough people to cause a problem with, with that kind of uh, that kind of legal thing. Most of these were frowned upon, but at the same time, they still had a kind of romantic aura about them. Did, did any of these lot ever, any of these adventurers and mercenaries ever turn up again in any other of the conflicts of the world? Yes, yeah, they did a lot. I mean, a lot of them turned up in, a few of them up in the Spanish Civil War. I mean, de Berrier we were talking about, and de Wet tried to join the, uh, the Francoist, uh, fascist or nationalist forces, but were turned down because they'd served with the Italians. Del Valde served actually with the fascist forces for a while, so people found out he'd served for Ethiopia. Then he had to make a run for Portugal, the Portuguese border. He went to Cuba, then came back and fought for the Republic, so a, a true mercenary. Konovalov, the white Russian, uh, was also – I don't think he fought, but he was certainly uh, helping out the Francoists. 
Some of them went and within China uh, in the Second World War. People like the Viking Tam, who'd been the Swedish guy, he was fighting uh, in Finland against the communists. I guess, I guess the Soviets not against the communists. Didn't didn't Black Eagle? Oh, Black Eagle. Hugh, um, his name escapes me. He didn't. He, Hugh, Hubert Julian. He didn't even volunteer for the uh, the Finns. He went to Finland for about a week. Yeah. <laughs> so did a lot of people. There was actually a, a lot of uh, British soldiers went. British volunteers went to fight called the Finnish volunteers. By the time they got there, the war was finished. So the same thing with with Julian. Really, you know, he turned up. He looked impressive in a nice uniform, and then he went back to New York again. But there wasn't much he could have done, to be honest. To be fair, I love it. I mean, I, I, I love Evelyn War's Scoop, which is a parody of the war in Ethiopia. But what amazed me was is how close Scoop seemed to be. To the reality of the war. Oh yeah, well, Evelyn Waugh was—he'd come to Ethiopia back in 1930 for the coronation. He actually wrote *Black Mischief* about the coronation. This is the novel from 1930, and then he came back again uh, as a war correspondent, I think, for the Daily Mail or something like that. And he was around for a few months like before the war started, and, and the first couple of months of the war. And then he got so bored he went home because nothing was happening. But all the stuff he writes about in Scoop is based on reality, you know. And he also wrote a book at the terrible title, War in Abyssinia, which is like a non-fiction version of that. And he does mention people like John Robinson. Because John Robinson, the, the, it was called the Brown Condor, by the way. Him and the Black Eagle had a fight in a hotel because <laughs> for personal reasons. Uh, and he'd been involved in some kind of bit of a weird scam in the, in the opening days of the war where Italians had invaded and, bom- and they'd bombed Adwa up in the north. And... Robinson had been up there and he'd had to fly away. He'd got back. He got back in one piece. And then Ethiopia asked him basically to lie about it to to get sympathy for the Ethiopian cause in the European newspapers. He had to claim that like some white Swedish nurse had been killed in the heart and the hospital had been destroyed. And this was quite a big story for a while. And then Warren was the person who actually going to interrogate or interrogate, you know, question him and his tailors, I think, in Addis Ababa, and got the truth that it actually hadn't actually happened, that there wasn't a, a nurse, the hospital didn't even exist. And so he got a bit of a scoop from that. And I think it disillusioned him a bit. But also, war supported the Italians. You know, he was a Catholic. He was very, you know, pro-European. So I think he saw Italy as being this kind of Catholic, civilized Western nation. And it was quite well known. He, was, he wasn't very popular in, in Ethiopia, even with the other journalists, because his views were... Um, didn't chime in with their pro-Ethiopian feelings. But he didn't care. He didn't like journalists anyway. Well, I was just quite, you know, known for being quite a Serbic. I mean, what amused me was that, you know, there's the, the, the whole pun in it about how they, uh, in Scoop, about how they believe themselves to be white Africans, yet didn't uh, the Ethiopians set themselves up to be white Africans as well, which I thought was completely nonsense in Scoop, and then it turns out to be true. There is some truth in it. Apparently, I mean, the Ethiopians were so xenophobic, so they hated everybody. And it's alleged that I think back in either the late 19th or early 20th century, a, a Haitian, like a French Haitian, uh, a sort of black guy, very interested in sort of pan-African solidarity. He made his way to Ethiopia to see uh, Menelik II, the emperor, and gave this big speech about the need for kind of a black brotherhood across the nation, across the seas, and how you know the black people would rise up against you know, the Caucasians and it was time to fight for their freedom. And Menelik said, oh, that's very interesting, but it doesn't apply to us because you can see we're Caucasian. It's been, it's been, maybe he was misquoted, you know, because the Ethiopian language was a, not quite the idea when he described those things. But it's true that they didn't really have, they didn't have a sense of themselves as being so black in the way that other Africans, or certainly African Americans, did. It's, so it, yeah, it's a, they weren't quite what you know, Caucasian or white Africans, the way that War says it. But there was certainly an element of that. They thought themselves as being completely different to everyone else around, more in common with the Europeans they had in common with fellow Africans. That's where he's pulling it from, isn't it? If, yeah, yeah, he's exaggerating as always. Yeah, there yeah, is yeah, a, yeah. a bit of truth. In there's, a, there's a strange thing there, sort of kicking around. You know, I don't know much about the inter- international brigades in, in the Spanish Civil War, but you know, ha- you know, that follows immediately after. Um, had they had they learnt anything from the uh, Ethiopian experience? Um, the Italians, do you mean, or, or people in general? <laughs> well, either, either side, because the, wasn't there in, in international brigades on both sides in the Spanish Civil War? I was going to say, it, was the Spanish Civil War experience of foreigners wanting to fight for them similar to the Ethiopian? To some extent. I think it's interesting that um, when the Spanish Civil War breaks out, it's much more uh, uh, like a popular war. Because the war in Ethiopia would confuse people, particularly on the left, because you have Italian fascists, obviously bad people to the left, but then you have a black emperor. You know, which is not quite the same thing as being a revolutionary communist. So uh, the left were not hugely enthusiastic about the Ethiopian war. They, you know, they did some propaganda, but the Soviet Union didn't want to support um, the Ethiopians. But when the war in the Spanish Civil War breaks out, it's literally a war as it's seen 
perhaps not correctly, but between communism and fascism. So the left want to get involved in this. It's also a lot closer, I guess. So now, um, in a way where the Ethiopians were not recruiting foreigners, didn't really want them. In the, in the Republic, you have uh, you have the international gates where people are being targeted, saying, please come and fight for us. It's important. And they're having their, their, their passage paid. There's rat lines getting them from, even from far away as America to Spain. And on the other side, you have the Germans, the Italians who are fighting, of course, the Moroccans who come up, and about 12,000 other kind of foreigners who make their way to, um, to Spain to fight for the nationalists. It's kind of superficially the same, that you have, sort of, if you like, a certain right versus left. But it's not about colonialism. It's not about sort of, uh, African dictators and African um, emperors. It's seen as being more a kind of European war. In fact, the left turn out some truly racist propaganda against the Moroccans who fought for General Franco, saying this is a terrible war crime. He's introducing you know, what they call African barbarians into a European war. So race played a big part in that, and presumably also in Ethiopia as well. Yeah, I, I didn't know if they were uh, you know, more effective when they used... Because they obviously did utilise them. And, and, and it's funny because the International Brigade, it's often, I guess in the English-speaking world, it's you get you, you hear a lot of... A lot of their stories. Yeah, well, they were heroes. I mean, that's the way they were seen. I mean, I, that's, that's not necessarily the, the wrong view to take. I mean, but at the same time, you remember that uh, there were maybe about like I think a quarter or something like that were members of the Communist Party, and another quarter kind of joined when they were in Spain. And if you're a communist in 1936, you weren't very big on democracy. You know, you may have been fighting for what you guys being the proletariat and, and good causes, but you were not someone who believed in you know one man, one vote. So it's, and they were supported by Stalin. It was you know. Like Hitler, a totalitarian, mass murdering dictator. So it's understandable why they would be uh, remembered. But yeah, it's it's a diff- it's a difficult place. It's a difficult thing. No one's going to remember the the fascists who went to fight for Franco, understandably. But the international brigades, a lot of the the, the real politics is stripped away. It's worth noting, though. I think back in two thousand and one, there was an effort in I think New Hampshire of all places in America. To put up a plaque for the international brigades, which is you know, there are plaques around the world in, in Britain, in London, everywhere. You know, it's gonna be like the red star and the clenched fist, and a quote from uh, La Passionara. and it got a massive amount of controversy because you know they were accused of supporting communism, which I suppose in a way they were doing. You know, there's a lot. We've got John Birch Society got involved uh, and things like that. It's it's complicated. Let's leave it at that. I don't think I have anything, any, anything else. I just you know, as I say, I just threw the international brigades thing in because I didn't know. You know, if there was any parallels to be drawn, or uh, it's such a funny time of the wo- of, of the world. It was kind of things were sort of, as we alluded to before, you know, magical and Poirot esque, and all these people going off doing wonderfully adventurous sounding things. Oh yeah, it's, it's basically the thing about Ethiopia. It's like a kind of real life pulp adventure. Now you know, people really die, and they're tens of thousands. But at the same time, the people who turn up there are these. They're like real life Indiana Joneses, but with dodgier politics and more whiskey. You know, they really are almost like fictional characters, but they're real. They're real people. Hula Gillian was a real person. You know, Elaire de Berrio, this stunt pilot and journalist from North Dakota, really was pretending to be a, a count from France in Ethiopia. It's, you know, there really was, you know, Japanese secret, you know, society people from the Black Dragon Society wandering around Addis Ababa trying to kind of form coups and trying to have secret it's plots. Really it's just truly, truly strange. How, how did you piece it all together? I mean, there's so many different strands. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it was very difficult. I mean, I thought at first when I was looking into it, because I knew about, actually, I think I knew about who, um, Hugh DeWitt and uh, Hilaire de Berrio first. I had a book by a guy called Brian Bridgman called The Flyers, which I think he's dead now, but it's a, it's a history of kind of mercenary pilots in the interwar period. Very good book for what it's worth. And it mentions briefly this bit about Ethiopia. So I thought I'd investigate that. And Hubert Julian came up because uh, my second book was called Katanga 1960 to 63, about a short lived uh, African nation in what's now the Congo. And Julian turned up in that. He was like, then he was obviously older, but not much wiser. He was a, an arms dealer who kept getting arrested by the United Nations. You know, <laughs> That is another kind of Pulp Fiction adventure, real life Pulp Fiction adventure in Katanga. It's like the birth of the white mercenary in Africa. You know, And so I got so Julian from that. And then I just started piecing together the, the news, news stories. And suddenly it became, well, you know, when I found out the Belgians were fascist, when I found out there were Nazis fighting with Haile Selassie. Something we didn't talk about. There were, as a, a an Austrian called Dr. Valentin Schuppler, apparently a very good trauma surgeon from Vienna, who was also a diehard national socialist. He'd had some involvement in the coup, the failed coup of 1934, and that's why he left, uh, left uh, Austria, because the police were after him. And he'd come to Ethiopia to have a chance to fight against the Italians because they'd ruined the, the, the Nazi coup in Austria. So you have this kind of diehard Nazi 
the photograph next to Haile Selassie of the royal family, helping save the lives of you know, black Africans against fascist, from fascist bombs. You couldn't really yeah, make it up if you tried. It's just, it, it's, as I say, it, it's, it's brilliant. But I couldn't imagine how you can, you know, start to piece together. I, I presume a lot of these people, did they write memoirs? Yeah, we were so sort of lucky in that a part of Sack wrote a memoir in Czech, which is actually a really good book. It's a shame he never got translated. He wrote it, I think, at the time he was, he was under the communist dictatorship. So obviously it's obviously absolutely pro, um, so anti-fascist and the like. But it's a really, really good book. It kind of, he's one of the few... He was, he was a travel writer anyway, and so he doesn't write it as a war memoir. He writes it more as a kind of, you know, this is what Ethiopia is like. So he doesn't write, you know, war and death, but, you know, so he actually tells the truth. He doesn't go around sort of telling, you know, claiming to be a hero when he wasn't. It's a generally well-written book. Del Val, the Cuban millionaire, he wrote a book which is basically mostly nonsense. He wrote it, first of all, the ghostwriter for um, some um, magazine, I think, in South America. They got put into a, an early paperback. It actually had like a sealed section of photographs at the back, stapled shut, full of dead bodies. It was a bit, bit weird. And he, his trick was basically to tell any story he'd heard about Ethiopia and put himself at the centre of it. Even though I, you know, I cross reference and other stuff, it's just he wasn't, he wasn't there. It wasn't true. But there's enough truth in there to make it an interesting story. You know, you can work out where he was and what he was doing. And there were a lot of journalists around at the time, so they do kind of record these people. And some of them, the other, you know, Hubert Julian was a, you know, a big personality. There's a book about him. The Turks have some interest in Turkey from sort of, um, academics, you know, for what they went over there. You put these bits together, and eventually the whole story, whole story comes to life. But it is very, very strange. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that seems like a good place to finish. Uh, thank you, Christopher. If you guys are looking for something to read over the Christmas break, you won't be disappointed with Lost Lines of Judah. I will put a link on the website. And if you finish that and it's still not New Year, we'll try reading Evelyn Waugh's Scoop. So the next episode of the podcast will be on the 15th of December, the day before the anniversary of the Battle of the Bulge. And that is what we'll be looking at, the 110th Infantry Regiment who were in the front line when the German offensive started. Uh, don't forget, it's patreon.com slash ww2podcast to become a patron of the show. I do release extras from time to time for those who support the uh, the podcast uh, so I think that must be it for now I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening <laughs>